Hello everyone. Thank you for joining DataCon LA 2022. Welcome to the track Data Infra Infrastructure and Security. My name is Tanmay and our co-host today is Riti. Please keep your phones on silent during the ses session and don't hesitate to raise your hand if you have any questions. This session is cur currently streaming via Zoom and will be recorded. It will be available online in a few weeks. Today we have a guest, Mr. Jagjit Dhaliwal, and he will be taking about talking about the title "Unlock the Full Potential of Data Platforms Through Automation." Jagjit Dhaliwal is Vice President, Global C CIO, Industry Leader at UiPath, where he partners with client CIOs on the, on their automation journeys. Jagjit is responsible for ensuring every CIO that leverages the UiPath Enterprise Automation Platform understands how best to apply automation within their organizations and opportunities to accelerate this digital transformation. Without further ado, I hand this over to the speaker. Thanks for joining, Jagjit. Thanks, Amin. Team, thanks for coming over, and uh, apologies for the late start. So ironically, like in a technology forum, we are actually running into technology challenges. So we were trying to run the PPT on a Mac and it didn't work out. <laughs> okay, so by the way, how many of you have heard about your part? Right, great. So at least there is some new thing for the people who haven't heard about it. So, so currently, as uh, Tanmay mentioned, I am part of UiPath, so I'm running a CIO practice. So I take care of all the technology automations, uh, consumer experience automations, and it's been just a one-year journey within UiPath. But prior to that, I've been associated with this platform for more than five years, and I've seen the journey how this whole ecosystem of automation has evolved over the period of time. And you might be correlating UiPath with RPA if you have heard that term, robotic process automation. And people think that it's synonyms. And that's where these, all these platform journeys started. And RPA is nothing but it's all about screen scraping, that how we can actually read the data from our screens, be it a legacy platform, so we get your thick client or anything, and then read the data and then process it. So that was the origination of the RPA journey. And when I was in Cognizant working for Warner Brothers, that's when we did a lot of RPA automation for IT operations and finance operations and so on. And uh, then in my last role as a deputy CIO for LA County, mm -hmm. I actually set up the data and automation strategy because I believe that data and automation goes hand in hand. So there is so much potential a data platforms and the data pipeline has, but still there is a lot of manual work which our data analysts and engineering teams keeps on doing. So how platforms like UiPath is complementing the existing data platforms on the pipeline. And that's what I'll uh, give some uh, very high level summary of that. But seeing through all the journey, even talking about LA County. So we, uh, since I was responsible for health services and COVID was a big uh, impact for us from a resourcing perspective, when we had to ramp up resourcing to provide all the support. So be it contact tracing, or uh, data reporting, fetching the data from hospitals and clinics, and then analyzing and then publishing the reports to the public as well as submitting the reports to states. So we didn't have a staff for that. So all that work which we use UiPath there as the automation tool, which was a, another layer on top of your data layer, which you already typically see. So that's what I'm going to touch upon. So, and apologies for the messing of some of the formatting. So it doesn't look like this in, a, in, a, in my slide here. <laughs> so uh, as I mentioned that uh, I have seen that journey starting from RPA to end-to-end -end automation platform. And what I mean by that is because automation is not about just whatever process you have, you just build the automation on. On the, on the ground, the reality is you may not actually have a full understanding of the process. And I'm talking about a complex process, let's say a P2P process or a procurement process supply chain process. So these processes evolve over the period of time and no one person have a good understanding of what the end to end process looks like. And more the larger the organization or legacy the organization is, documentation is always a pain. You may not have up-to-date documentation. So how to even identify what portion of that process should be automated versus re-engineered versus uh, retired and versus identify what are the bottom. 
So the discovery of the process plays a big role. So that's a key component of our platform. So using the process mining, task mining tools, we actually draw the whole mind map of your process. So that way you can see what the happy path look like, where the data flow is happening, where are the bottlenecks, where are the redundancy in the base are there, what are the exceptions are there. So that can give you a whole mind map of it. So that's extremely important because that will help you identify which portion to automate first. Once you discover it, then you build the automation and then you have to deploy and then the engage part of it. How are you gonna engage? Because the humans or analysts, they're gonna be a part of it because everything is not gonna be automated. There will be some exceptions where human has to get involved. So simple example is if your data analyst is preparing some dashboards, and they are pulling the data from different sources. If it is an unstructured sources, let's say a website or PDF or images, so your traditional automation may not work. So manually analysts probably have to go to the website and fetch that information. So that kind of human in a loop situations will be there where you have to engage uh, with the robot as well as human. And then when we are talking about enterprise automations, we are talking about thousands of automation and how you can have a governance model around it because the last thing you want is a security vulnerability and you want to ensure that whatever standards, enterprise architecture, policies, procedures you have established across organization, you are able to replicate the same in the UI path. You don't want to develop it again. So that's the fourth component that how we enable the governance at an enterprise scale. And that leads us to the end-to-end -end automation journey uh, for any organization. So we provide that scalability, be it any environment, be it your hybrid uh, on-premises or cloud. So we offer automation in all three and we provide the governance which can link it back to your enterprise governance model. So with that, uh, if I think from a CIO perspective, so I've been pretty much talking to CIOs every other day globally across industries. So if you think from their priorities perspective, they are always balancing their effort and their energy between these three pillars. So it is about how I can optimize my journey, how I can optimize my IT, my data, my security. Nobody wants to spend money on operations. So more I can squeeze in the OPEX dollars, it's better for a CIO to move those dollars to the digital platforms. So they always look at how I can reduce my operational cost and I can move that cost to the capital thing. So that's one thing. And then secondly, they are responsible for the internal employee experience. So how we can empower our employees to enable the self-service capability so that they have a seamless experience when they are dealing with IT. And then similarly, from an external world perspective, the customer experience. So as the customers are interacting with any of the front office applications which you're using, how we can make that experience seamless and how we can enable the 360 degree view of customers. So these are some of the priorities which CIO juggles with. And my focus is always about that, how I can reduce the effort on operation side and how I can move the bandwidth to the digital platforms. But while we are moving there, how I can even accelerate the journey because nobody wants to do that two to five year enterprise projects. Everyone wants to implement the SaaS implementations. Can I do it in six months? Can I do it in three months? We don't have the waterfall methods of like doing SAP journeys of five years and by the time you deploy those, the things change drastically. So how we can reduce the overall life cycle of the software itself. So I'll touch upon those two areas. So let's start with the op operations first. So when I say operations in the IT, so you will have service management, which is typically our ITSM, where the employee interacts. And that goes to your applications. Then you have data. Then you have an infrastructure operations and then you have security. So these are a typical high level component of any IT landscape you see. The complexity may vary, but end of the day, these are the systems you're gonna see. And how automation helps in it is three ways. One is first focus for us is how we can actually shift the demand because all the help desk activities, which is coming to your help desk agents, by enabling a self-service capabilities, you are reducing the demand and the tickets which are coming to agents. So by implementing chatbots, by implementing the auto res ticket resolution, you are actually empowering your employees to not pick up the phone or not send an email or not having a long conversations with the help desk employee or wait for days before your tickets get resolved. 
how we can shorten that window so that we can shift the demand. So that's the first category. Then second category is in the application and data layer. So IT teams get a lot of ad hoc requests, be it uh, application, access control, or, or maybe it could be ad hoc data reporting. Especially in data, like I have seen throughout my career that a lot of data requests. I need this kind of dashboard. I need this kind of report. So how we can enable the self-service capabilities at data layer? So that's, that's a big component of it because you don't want your data engineers to spend time on those ad hoc reportings. They should be focusing on more complex data engineering tasks rather than developing some ad hoc dashboards for executives. So preparing those two kind of reports and any ad hoc requests which come from business, how we can automate that and how can software robot can be a first level of defense for these data engineering team before they go there. So that comes in the fulfilling the demand. And the last but not least is one of my favorite is this is all backend. So you have a lot of infrastructure, be it cloud or on-premises, and then you have security operations tools. And even though we have so many performance monitoring tools, application monitoring, we have AI ops, we have SecOps, but in spite of having so many tools, why are our analysts, infrastructure and security analysts, are so alert for it? Because end of the day, even though we are saying we are implementing AI in these tools and they are taking actions, but end of the day, the number of alerts are increasing too. Like in one of the research, the, during the pandemic, the security activities have increased by 40 to 50 percent. But our budget and our security and this capacity didn't increase. And what has started happening is because they can manage so many alerts, so they have started dropping those alerts. And you only need one alert mess to actually cause a ransomware. So how we can actually solve the problem of taking an action on those alerts, which the security operations are generating for you. These are thousands and I would say thousands and million, dollars, million alerts which comes in from different types of systems. And analysts cannot do that and how we can automate that. So I'm just giving a high level view, but I'm gonna actually deep dive into data and security with some of the examples. And what it leads to is, by enabling these three categories of automation, you actually can reduce your operational costs by at least 10 to 20%. And that's a big number for any CIO. Typically, a CIO spends about 50 to 60% of the IT budget in operational costs. And if you are saving 20% of that, you are actually enabling that budget for the capital projects. So they can spend more time on developing new solutions rather than continue maintaining it. And that's the value of automation, which bring, we bring onto table for the IT teams. Now shifting gear from operations to development. So in any software lifecycle, be it agile or waterfall, I'm not talking about methodology, but end of the day, what you are doing is these five stages. So you do requirement gathering, you do development, you do my data migration and other migration activities, you do testing and deployment. And let's say if this whole phase is taking 12 months, can I reduce that whole thing to 10 months? Absolutely, yes. And how we do that is, first is a discover, because we never have a good as is requirement document, even to even start the conversation of requirement analysis. So by process mining, we give that whole mind map so that by the time you are going into a requirement gathering conversation with business teams, you have a full view of the as is process. So that will expedite your to be process conversations. So we shorten that window. Then when it comes to the development, not only UiPath, this whole uh, ecosystem of low code platforms and no code platforms, which are really spanning up in this area. And it is all about that, how we can use a pre-built accelerators for a predefined development project. Like if you're talking about IAS, uh, if it is just a lift and shift from on-premises to AWS, it's a very standard set of activities which we need to do. How we can use a pre-built accelerator. So we have about 300 accelerators in our marketplace and we have uh, integration with all the enterprise platforms. So let's say, let's say if your process touching three different enterprise system and you are only upgrading one and you're keeping other two, so actually you can use our native integrations to continue with your on-premises and cloud or hybrid situations. So that's how we shorten the development cycle. Then when it comes to the migration, even though you develop the lot of ETL scripts or you can do it through regular uh, data migration activities, 
But the ground reality is the sources of your data may not be very streamlined. So you might be actually fetching data from mainframe, or it could be your unstructured data, maybe coming from a PDF, or maybe different types of reports. And that's where the complexity starts coming in, where your typical ETL process starts building. Or even if you develop it, the amount of effort you're gonna spend for that one-time migration is humongous. So UiPath, here, what we do is since we have a UI plus API capabilities, irrespective of what your technology platform is, I, I can actually fetch the data from screen. I can fetch the data from Citrix, VDI environments, any mainframe environment. Wherever I can connect through API, I'll do it. And wherever I cannot, I can do the UI scraping too. And using a computer vision, I can go into any VDI or back the screen process too. So I have that flexibility to read structured and unstructured data. And I'm not saying that you have to get rid of your ETL scripts, but it's complementing whatever your ETL script cannot do. Our, our tool can come in on top of it and it can help you fill up the gap, which you probably might end up doing manually. Can we just ask some clarification? Yeah, absolutely. Is this uh, automation process for any kind of uh, solution or industry? Or is specifically targeting any, like, I mean, because in terms of, uh, the data itself or, or the tasks which you would need to automate would be very specific to like any particular so if i say think that okay now every banking app has a chatbot and it is kind of like you know send all the queries to that and then is it that if one company implements it then that solution becomes easily available to all the other banks or yeah. how does that Thanks. Yeah, no, great question. And so far, I was just talking about very industry agnostic way because we are technology agnostic and industry agnostic, but that's our base platform. What we do on top of it is we build the industry solutions. So like I am running a CIO practice, so I build all the technology solutions. So if I have to interact with infrastructure or security, what kind of accelerators we need. Similarly, my peers, we have an industry practice leads, which develops the pre-built solution for each industry. So these 300 accelerators, which I'm talking about, it's a combination of industry plus horizontal solutions. So if I have a banking, because all the top 10 banks are our clients. So Wells Fargo, like if they are already using the digital assistant. So that digital assistant is installed on all the employees, most of the employees. So when, if they have to kick off that automation, they can just click it in their tray, the digital system will pop up and they can kick off those automations. So it's a, that kind of experience is there. And once you build it, because it's part of Accelerator, other banks can easily use it. So they don't need to build it from scratch. So we keep on populating our marketplace. It's very similar to Microsoft or any other enterprise marketplace, which you might have seen. Does that help? And it kind of then also, it's kind of like a same experience for all the different things. I don't know if companies are concerned about having the need. Yeah, so we, we give a pre-built accelerator to jumpstart the development. So end of a day, you can white label it. You can always customize it to your need. So we are not here to like give the end-to-end -end solution because end of a day, we are trying to fit it into your landscape. Because if I develop something which is very customized to one client, it it's may not like fit. Like giving the Lego blocks and then they can... That's a perfect example. So I always use Lego as an example. And uh, if you think about Lego, so... There are Legos which are very generic, like there's a set which doesn't give anything, but it gives ideas. Mm -hmm. So think of that. But once you start giving it, okay, you can make a car or you can make a doll and all. And we enable those, but we don't give those because every car might be different, but we give a skeleton of a car. So think of that way. Okay. So we go up to that level of accelerators. So that it gives you a jump start. The whole idea is that how I can reduce the time frame, whatever commonalities are there. I can actually automate that process part of it. Basically giving a template to everyone. Right. So as I was talking about the data pipeline, so let's double click on the data and security. And uh, I'll actually show one demo and see if that helps you clarify things more. So from a pipeline perspective, again, you may have this pipeline today with any of the data platform. And it could be your on-premises uh, or it could be Snowflake or it could be AWS and all. End of a day, what we are doing is we are playing a role in four key areas. The first one is your data collection and ingestion and storage. And this is something you probably may might be doing with ETLs, but 
when it comes to the unstructured data or when it comes to fetching data from a legacy apps, that's where the challenges starts happening. And that's where UiPath complements your ETL scripts. So I can actually go into any mainframe system, if, even if the terminal emulation is there or not, I can fetch that information. Or the PDF examples, fetching her data from the PDFs, or if it is a very different formats. Like the example I was giving about LA County, when, when the COVID happened in the contact tracing, we were getting data from 300 different hospitals and things. Everyone was sending data in a different format. And you don't have a time to work with 300 different agencies to standardize it when you are actually on a day-to-day -day crunch. So you have to accept it and you have to bring that, abstract that whole complexity. And we use 10 bots just to manage that uh, 15 people work during that time frame. And imagine like we were getting about 5,000 5, interviews a day as a part of contact tracing. The that, that's the data which we were processing on a daily basis. Before implementation of this solution, we had a backlog of about 200,000 interviews uh, using our existing staff. So that's the kind of situation which typically on a ground you face. So technology solutions can do so much and how you can identify the areas where a traditional technologies is not working and you can complement that with uh, the automation platforms. So once the uh, data is uh, ingested, then the second category comes is about enrichment and processing. So, so it can be your simple CRUD operations. And one of the best example I give in the, in, in the CRUD operations is GDPR or your California Privacy Act. So as a part of that act, if you have to do the data deletion today, Hardly any company have actually automated the whole process end to end. So if you get an email from a client that I want to delete my data across all your systems, what it happens today on a ground is you actually send an email to all the application owners and then they go and manually delete it and then inform you back. And that's how you aggregate that information and then do it. It's a multi-day process. Even if you automate it, it's, no, it's very difficult to achieve that because every application have a different policies and different uh, platforms, you actually cannot develop the pipeline across those applications. And that's where instead of a human going into each and every owner, you could have a UiPath robot go in and delete those, log in into the application, delete it, and then go back and aggregate the report and respond back to the customer within the same day that yes, we have taken care of your data deletion. So that's the kind of cloud operations beyond the typical cloud operations which you perform. Then third category is about analytics when it comes to the AI and ML models. So we have a whole AI engine within our platform. So we have a pre-built uh, AI ML uh, models, especially around language, sentiment analysis, image analysis, or any of the document processing. If you are using a standard example, to your example, if, uh, if you're using a banking, Let's say if you're doing a taxation, you have a W9 form or 1044 form, 1019 form and all. So we have a pre-built AI models for it. So it can auto detect that this is a type of form it is. And these are the fields I need to fetch from this document. If it is an invoice, it will auto detect that I would need the address, I would need the invoice, PO number and amount and all. So that kind of models are already pre-built. But uh, you can always bring in your own custom models if you would like. So it can fetch in and you can invoke automation based on that models. So that's how we accelerate the analytics part of it. And last but very important is triggering the business actions based on the data which you are fetching. So once you visualize the data, let's say if uh, you have a dashboard of supply chain and you start seeing that your inventory count is showing low. And based on that visualization, if you have to perform certain business action. So it's very difficult otherwise to do that, but a UiPath robot can actually trigger based on a screen event or any backend event, and I can trigger the business process from it. So that's how I kind of fit in into your whole process. How am I doing my time? Yeah, eight minutes. Eight minutes, okay. Uh, so I'll just speed it up. So, and this is how our native integration works. So we have 200 plus native integrations. So you can call a UiPath bot from any enterprise platform as well as other way around too. So from enterprise platform, you can invoke the UiPath automation. So that's how our native integration, bi-directional integration works. So let me cover the slides and then we'll see if we need to get a time to play the video. I have a small demo with Altrix to show how we do that, but we'll come back to it. 
So moving from data to security. So in, in the security, this is how your typical landscape looks like. So you will have application data, infrastructure, identity access management layer. And on top of it, you will have uh, your security endpoint security layer. That's where your antivirus and uh, endpoint protection layer comes in. And then on top of it, you probably will have EDR, XDRs, and SIAM. So you may have one of these, or maybe all, depending on complexity, or you may have AI ops tools. But what's happening is, in spite of having this layer, what it does is it means you are generating more alerts. And end of the day, it's the security analyst who have to make a lot of decisions about how to analyze those alerts and then take actions. And what we do is we complement, we are not here to replace any of your SIAM layer. But what I do is I take the alerts from the SAM layer and I can take the action using the event-driven automation. And I can, you can actually, the security analyst can on demand for the automation as well as actually use it. And then using the UI plus API integration, it can actually perform the action on this layer. So I'll give a one simple example, uh, which is actually we have implemented within UI Park also, a brute force attack. So, you may get a lot of URLs or IP addresses as a part of the first attack. And now what you need to do is you have to go into all your firewall systems and block those IPs. So AI ops tool can do that if it has an integration and if your firewall system is modernized. Let's say if it is a Palo Alto network, most likely you will have integration. But if it is a Cisco older versions, it will not have. So what will happen is, for each IP, you have to go to firewall and manually block that IP. That's what the security analyst does on the ground. So instead of analyst going into 10 different firewall system for each IP, you actually can have a bot do that. And on an average, we block 20 to 30,000 brute force attack within UiPath. So we drink our own champagne. We use all the automation which I'm talking about. So that's the thing which we bring in from our security operations. And just to sum it up, uh, these are some of the examples of a security. So I talked about uh, threat remediation and uh, prevention and rem remediation actions using brute force, but your whole identity lifecycle process. So from your user control, any of the onboarding, offboarding, and uh, your access control of the user activities, user management, license management, so all that you can actually do automate these things. And then audit and compliance. If you're doing a SOX compliance or SOX2 or any ISO compliance thing, so you actually can use the bots to collect the samples for you instead of humans going in on a biannual or a quarterly basis, fetching that information. You could have uh, automated that and that's how you can actually increase the sampling size. And in fact, you can also make it more proactive that instead of waiting for your semi-annual audit, you can, your bot can actually send the notification as and when any control failure is happening. If someone is violating a separation of duty, so you can actually catch it at that time rather than getting it finding during your auditing process. So that's how you can actually be more proactive around it. And last but not least, even the incident response. So there are always standard response activities, be it about blocking a certain subnet or notification process or identifying what are the compromised users you have in your systems. So these kind of standard activities you do as a part of incident response. So that's pretty much it from it. These are some of the numbers from our internal ops itself. So I didn't share a lot of clients, but we are right now working with 10,000 clients globally across all industries. And these are some of the use cases that I thought I'll share it with you from a data and security perspective that how it's complementing any of your existing platforms which you are using on the ground.